Uh, we're here uh, today, June 7th, 2013, to interview Charles Cassell at his home in Northwest Washington, D.C. Uh, as you will hear, Mr. Cassell is a civil rights activist who was also active in the anti-freeway campaign of the 1960s and 1970s in D.C., as well as a leader in the D.C. statehood fight in the early days and still active in that fight some 40 years later. In addition, he is a World War II veteran prominent architect and a longtime jazz aficionado and co-founder co -founder with his wife Linda of the Charlin Jazz Society and much more as you will hear. Uh, good afternoon Mr. Cassell. And good let's, afternoon. Let's start off by asking you just to uh, tell us where and when you were born about your family and mm -hmm. uh, we'll move on from there then. I was born in Washington DC in 1924. My father was an architect, and he had built the house that I grew up in. Where was that? Uh, that was at 707 Fairmont Street. If you think of Fairmont and Georgia Avenue, my father built three duplexes, one right on the corner, one just north of that, and one around the corner on Fairmont Street. And then one further down, let's see, one, two, three. Yeah, okay. There were three of the duplex north of 2700, 2700 on the corner, and 707. Um, my father had also built a duplex further down that our family doctor lived in, who delivered those days. Doctors used to come to your house and deliver you right in your mother's bed. And was that the case with you? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh -huh. All four of us. Uh-huh. Doc Stratton, mm -hmm. his family friend. Mm -hmm. And, um, there, yeah, you say there were four of you. You had uh, two... Uh... Yes, yes. I was the oldest. Mm -hmm. I had two daughters. I beg your pardon. <laughs> two sisters. And a brother who was the youngest. Mm -hmm. We... Uh, had a wonderful mother, a beautiful mother, um, a prominent father, but a very stern individual. So we related more to our mother. Mm -hmm. As I grew older, I began to accept my father more, his sternness and his discipline, because I began to, my mother used to try to make me understand that he brought home a lot of the frustrations as a very prominent professional who still had to accept the discrimination and uh, since he uh, most of his business associations were Caucasian at the university he was the architect and he had to approve this is at Howard uh, yes. Mm -hmm. yes and he had to approve all of their work so uh, <clears throat> They treated him okay, but other than that, he was very, very much uh, disturbed at the fact that he'd go shopping at Landsberg or Hecht and <laughs> couldn't use the restroom, you know. And at that time, there were some uh, young people who were challenging that, and they get arrested right away just for sitting at a lunch counter. But uh, I enjoyed my youth. I went to the James Monroe School, which is on Columbia Road, just about six blocks above where we lived. And, uh, my home was 707 Fairmont Street. Um, then from there, well actually, I started kindergarten at the Lucretia Mott School, just below Howard University. And I remember how I cried when my mother left me there at, kindergarten all by myself till I got used to it. But then when we went to the first grade, we went to the Minor Teachers College. It's quite a promotion, huh? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. But we were, <laughs> we were the, uh, what should we say, the students that they were using to help the teachers learn how to handle people. Yes. Then I went to uh, James Monroe School when I finished there, I went to Garnet Patterson. Garnet Patterson is at 10th and U Streets. 
junior high. Junior high, yeah. For three years, that was from the sixth to the ninth grade. And that was exciting because for the first time, we began to change rooms. In other words, you'd have a home room, and then during the day, you'd go to an English teacher, to the shop teacher, to the print teacher, to the music teacher. That was exciting. And then Mr. Savoy, who was the principal, used to have uh, auditorium performances for us regularly to keep us interested in advancing and in, in the arts. So we saw some famous performers on, on the stage then. That, that was fun. Then... Uh, Who were some of those? Was that... Uh, what kind of performers were those? Well, I know what... I, I don't remember the names of them at that time, but there were the musicians, there were artists who would set up their artwork on the stage, and there were uh, writers who would uh, talk to us about literature and encourage us to become writers if we were so inclined. Was it uh, at this, around this time that you got interested in uh, jazz? Uh, was I was interested in jazz before that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I was in elementary school when I was interested in jazz. You know. People like Louis Armstrong were very entertaining mm -hmm. to begin with. And uh, Duke Ellington was very suave and very smooth. Mm -hmm. And we began to listen to the music. Mm -hmm. and, and your father, uh, you mentioned was stern. Uh, he didn't exactly approve of... Uh, no, he didn't. He liked the classics. He sat me down once, to, and he said, Now, I want you to listen to this uh, box air for G-string. Da, 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 And then he said, Now, don't you think that's really interesting music, more so than that, what you're listening to. So yeah, Dad, that, that, it's cool, you know, but, you know, I still like the jazz, because that's interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. right. And, but your mother was uh, oh, yes. more lenient on that. My mother was a very loving person. She understood the children. And my father was away all the time. He was so busy at the office, mm -hmm. That beginning in junior high school, my mother used to prepare his lunch and prepare his dinner, put it in a picnic basket, put me in the cab and send me to the office because he was too busy to come home for lunch and dinner. Mm -hmm. It wasn't bad because I met a lot of the people in the office and they were draftsmen and you know, were interesting people. No, no, um I guess before we move on with some years, we should just mention that he's an extremely um, noted architect and is oh, responsible yes. for mm -hmm. how many of the buildings on uh, Howard University's yeah. campus? Nine of them. Nine. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was born in Towson, Maryland, which is a suburb of Baltimore, to a rather poor family. His father uh, decided to move to Baltimore when he was quite young because the employment opportunities were better. His father drove a coal truck, his mother took in washing to supplement the family income. Um, my father's father, my grandfather, had a cousin in Charlottesville, West Virginia, who was a contractor. And my father's father took him to Charlottesville, West, West, West Virginia, to observe Cousin Wilkins' work. Cousin Wilkins was building a house at that time in the colored section of the city. And uh, I noticed on the wall of Cousin Wilkins' drafting room a beautiful drafting of a house, you know. So then we went back a year later, and there's this house looking exactly like that drawing on the wall. I was fascinated. I think that may be when I decided my father's profession was a good one. <laughs> I th maybe I'm interested in that. <laughs> um, so then my father, this is very interesting, in, he, my father was very studious, 
and very serious about his works in high school, not much interested in girls. He was nicknamed Al the Bookworm, because that was his concentration. He indicated when his, um, during his last year of high school, that he wanted to go to Cornell University, enroll in the School of Architecture, become an architect, and design buildings. His counselor called him in and said, I don't think that's a good idea. Your competence that you gain here in this segregated high school in Baltimore, Maryland, is not enough to get you into Cornell. He was devastated. His father agreed with him. He said, why don't you become a craftsman or a teacher or something, you know? But his mother was like my mother. She said, you want to become an architect? And then you become an architect. If you can't get into Cornell, you can go to Howard University. Uh, you can go to Hampton in Southern Virginia, right? I mean, he was determined he was going to Baltimore, so he borrowed money from her meager savings and moved to Ithaca. He enrolled in the Ithaca High School and repeated his last year. Then he qualified for entrance into Cornell. He matriculated at Cornell, but he had to find out, well, how am I going to support myself? You know, he, he couldn't afford to live in one of the dormitories. So he looked at, he sought out one of the professors in the School of Architecture, Professor George Young, and offered to George Young, lived on the outskirts of the campus, had his home there, my father offered to be the caretaker of his home and grounds if he could just live in the basement and have enough salary to pay his um, tuition and installments. So that's the way he got through his first two years. After his first two years, I think he started in 1915. 1917, the United States went to France um, to help out its allies uh, in, in France um, in World War I. My father enlisted. He became a second lieutenant, and he was training colored students in how to use the 75 millimeter and the 105 millimeter cannon. When the war was over, he came back to Cornell. Cornell had a policy. Those students who were so patriotic as to leave school and join the service, you'll get your degree whether you finish or not. So he had two years at Cornell, and everybody who who joined up got their good degrees. He went to um, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and worked for Mr. Alfred Weiner, who was an architect who designed uh, industrial plants, especially silk firms, silk plants. Um, you heard of Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington was, had just started Tuskegee Institute in Tuskegee, Alabama, and they were getting money from the federal government and from various donors, and they were wanted to build some new trade buildings to teach the various trades. But uh, he wanted, you know, he was interested in providing opportunities for African Americans. So he asked Cornell if they could recommend some somebody. Cornell said, yeah, we've got a guy. And they sent my father and the landscape architect down to Tuskegee, and they worked on these five buildings. Howard University heard about these African American architects at Tuskegee, so they brought them up there to begin an architectural program in the uh, science department. Um, Hazel was the landscape architect. He worked on universities developing landscape, and my father started an architectural program in the science department, and very shortly he persuaded the university to have an architectural department, 
which he was the head of. That went on for a couple of years. When they had the credits, he established the School of Architecture in Howard University, and he became the dean. After a couple of years or so at that, the university was getting more money from the federal, federal government, so they hired him as the university architect. Incidentally, are you aware of where Howard University gets its name from? I should, but I don't know. It was a Civil War general, Civil War general. who thought that African Americans whose ancestors were slaves could have an opportunity to gain a decent education. So he started Howard University, and he persuaded the federal government to provide the money for Howard University, and also to provide the money for building buildings there. Well, when my father was supervising the design and construction, the money at that time was coming through the Department of Interior, whose secretary was Secretary Harold Ickes. And Ickes was constantly on the campus monitoring how the university was using the federal funds. And he became uh, an admirer of my father's work in design and supervision. So he was the person who, how did I say, he praised my father at the at the inauguration of the Founders Library's last building. Um, did I mention that my father was let go? No, I didn't. I told you this during. Um, at, during the construction of the Founders Library, his last building there, uh, my father discovered that somebody in high authority there was siphoning off some of the for some of the materials provided by the government for his own use. My father prevailed upon him to stop. This person was of the higher office than my father, and he refused. My father, being responsible for all of the materials, had to report this to the federal government. The federal government made this person stop that practice. That, practice, that person had sufficient influence at the university that they were able to dismiss my father in retaliation. My father was working on his last building there, the Founders Library, and uh, it had been designed and it was under construction, about half, half finished. He refused to leave his office until he finished supervising the construction of the building that he had designed. They, this higher official, did not have him evicted because of his high standing with the Secretary of the Interior, which might damage any further funding. So they let him continue, and they kept his office staff there. When the job was finished in the, 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 the end of 1938, I believe, my father sued the university for back salary since he wasn't getting any pay, you know. And the university sued him for back rent because he had been fired, but he was still using the office. And my father's lawyer carried this, this was quite a scandal, carried this all the way to the Supreme Court, whereupon the university decided we better settle this. So they settled. My father won his case. And he got the tremendous sum in the settlement of $3,000. This is 1938. I guess that's a lot of money. With a billion dollars today. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to uh, just stop one second? Oh, sure. Yes. Okay. Wherever you want to stop. Oh, okay. Um, so, um, and you've carried this up to a point where you're almost, well, I guess you'd be finishing, uh, you're in high school probably about that period of time. and. Uh, and when you mentioned Cornell, of course, you ended up uh, going to Cornell. And I think, didn't a couple of your siblings go there also? My father had mandated that all of his children would go to Cornell, and they would all be architects. 
-hmm. Three of us did. Mm -hmm. I was the first. Mm -hmm. And I was there for two years, and then I got drafted into the service, mm -hmm. World War II. Mm -hmm. And when I finished, when you were in the service in World War II, you got so many points for the time that you served. Mm -hmm. I was only in two years, and there were many soldiers who had four and five years. Mm -hmm. So I would have had to wait a year in order to get back into Cornell. Mm -hmm. That time, my father in his office had uh, several draftsmen and two engineers, Francis Steele and Ed Morton. Mm -hmm. And they were graduates of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. My father thought that they were a very competent person. So he says, look, I think between the three of us, those two and me, we can get you into RPI right now and you won't have to wait a week, wait, wait a year. And that's what happened. That's why I went to Rensselaer. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm very glad that I went to Rensselaer because Rensselaer's focus is essentially on engineering, whereas Cornell was in art, art was in design. Mm -hmm. So between the two, I think I got a pretty good mm -hmm. background. And so, um, so after you, you finished at uh, Rensselaer, you came back to uh, D.C. and you alluded to or mentioned a few of the uh, racial, uh, segregated nature of the city before. And then you've been in World War II and you come back to D.C. and what do you find when you get back here as a city? Well, nothing's, nothing's changed. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing is that there was quite a professional community among our African Americans in Washington, D.C. And so many of us, we young folks, had never known anything other than that so we were quite comfortable in that arrangement. It was just those other folks over there, you know, and we weren't supposed to uh, it, we weren't supposed to aggravate them. <laughs> um, so, but the federal government was not discriminating. So I got my first position. By this time, my father had gone into real estate. Maybe I should speak of this first. He became so concerned about the discrimination and the fact, and especially in housing, you know. Since he's an architect, he decided that he would build a new city for us Africans where we would control our destiny. So he bought, with his own money, a 500-acre farm on the Chesapeake Bay, 16 miles across the bay from Cambridge, Maryland, and four miles north of the small town of Prince Frederick. That's where he was going to build his new town. Using the after-hours work of his architectural staff at Howard University, in two years they designed a complete city. Schools, parks, recreation, employment center, everything. That was the design. Mm -hmm. It also included a pier going out into the Chesapeake so that ships headed for Baltimore could take on personnel and cargo 70 miles above our property. I guess it was in the, the late, probably the, the, yeah, the late, the early 40s, a Senator Carter Glass of Virginia, I think it's the same glass of the Glass-Steagall Act, you know, rose on the floor of the Senate and strongly opposed the idea of the federal government putting money into a new city for colored folks? We're in the midst of a depression. Now what I didn't mention was my father was getting his money from, again, from Harold Ickes, who got for him a $5 million grant 
from the federal government and a $5 million loan. So it's hard to imagine you could build a city for that, but <laughs> that was the 30s. And that's what uh, Senator Carter Glass was opposing. The federal government, considering racial attitudes at that time, thought that it was politically prudent to withdraw the money. My father was devastated. He used to come home and play the piano. And he loved the classics, but he played love songs on the piano. And his personality was reflected in the, in the way he played. You're familiar with the song, Beautiful Lady? To you, beautiful lady, I raise my heart. He played it this way. <laughs> Bang. <laughs> but anyway, um, I, so since he's involved in this, New town, mm -hmm. before the government mm -hmm. cut off the money, he was not active in his architectural practice, so I took a position with the federal government, the Bureau of Yards and Docks, mm -hmm. just across the river, and uh, I was designing naval facilities, clinics, office buildings, Air, air forts, so forth. And I was there for several years, then I wanted to raise. I got started as a GS-7. To get a GS-9, I had to move to another job. So I, I went to work with the Veterans Administration. The Veterans Administration designing hospitals. And I really liked that because I was designing buildings with all the other architects, many architects. They were built in various parts of the country. And when the building was completed, we got to go visit those buildings, you see, and uh, advise the government of you know, how well the design was uh, serving its purpose. Then to get the next rate, I, went, I became a GS-9 there. To become a GS-11, I moved to the General Services Administration. General Services is, cons is responsible for all construction and buildings, maintenance of buildings for the federal government. And there, I was a space management architect, and then I became a um, person who traveled throughout different parts of the country to advise the government about existing federal facilities, whether they were in need of repair or whether they should be sold or whether they should be demolished. And my area was the New England area and each of us in the various parts of the country had a counterpart in that part of the country. So when I'd go to New England, I'd meet my counterpart, and then we would drive throughout New England, and I would make my recommendations. In 1960, after I bought my first house, I had a call from Julius Hobson, and I had been active in civic associations, you know. He said, I hear you, Hobson was from Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> I hear you a good man, and I, I got an organization called the Congress of Racial Equality. You do a good impression. Cool. <laughs> well, now nah. Yes, anyway, yeah. So he said, now, nah, I want you to come and work with me. We're going to make some changes in this town. You know you know how things are. You grew up in this town, didn't you? Right? I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. It's even worse down there than it is here. So uh, I'm having a meeting next weekend. Here's where we meet. I want you to come to it. Well, I was happy to join that. Besides, he sounded very interesting. So I joined up with the Congress of Racial Equality. It was headed at that time by... 
Farmer. James Farmer. James Farmer, yeah. And we used to meet at a little building that he had rented down on 9th Street, right at 9th and S Street. is in the first floor of a residence, I guess. And we started to doing a variety of things. One of the things was that the Capital Transit Company would not hire African Americans as motormen or bus drivers. So we decided we were going to change all that. Hobson didn't worry about anything. We were going to change it. <laughs> so what we did is we started to getting on the buses and not paying. But we take maybe 10, 15 people and just walk on in the back of the bus without paying, you know. They call the police and have us arrested. But they found that they had to call the police all over the city because our people were just not getting off of the streetcars. And, and then, of course, we had our signs and we were complaining about uh, discrimination against black folks. So Capital Trans, you remember the name of the guy who... Yeah, Roy Chalk. Yeah. Yeah. He finally changed his policy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Then there was the question of buying clothes downtown. Now, young African -Amer American men like to buy snappy clothes. And there was a Bruce Hunt. Did you ever hear that? Bruce Hunt was a haberdashery down on. Nine, around 9th and F Street. So Hobson said, well, let's, let's go change his policy, too. <laughs> so Hobson said, I won't see the manager. Well, who are you, sir? My name is Julius Hobson. I won't see the manager. What, what would you like to see him? About your hiring policies. Just a minute, the manager would come out. Said, now, I'm a statistician. I work for the federal government, you know. And I have determined that you're getting 60 percent of your business from African Americans, but yet you won't hire any of them. Look at all look at all those guys behind the counter. Not one of them is black. I says, "Well, Mr. Hobson, <clears throat> there's no discrimination here. Our clients are from all over the world. This is Washington, a very metropolitan area, and we." We have to serve people who come from different cultures, and our, our, our salespeople have to be able to deal with them. How I said, man, I don't care about that. All I know is if you don't get some black folks, I'm going to take 60% of your business. Hey, look, look outside. See that? We have about 50 people. You see, now half of them white. I think with big signs, you know, discrimination, you know. So, well, Mr. Hobson, if you think you can take 60% of our business, then you go right ahead. We, we have our policies. We're not going to change them. He said, Hobson said, well, I'll tell you what, this is Friday. I'll be back here on Monday. And when I get here on Monday, I want to look over and I want to see some dark face, thick lip, wide nostril black people working on the counters. You hear what I said? Mr. Hobson, I think it's about time for you to leave now. <laughs> All right, yeah, I'm leaving because i got to get ready to come back. <laughs> Monday morning we came back with our signs, and the interesting thing is that there were many white people who joined us, you know. And uh, we had the big signs, don't buy where you can't work. Black people stop buying. About a month later, the manager calls Hobson up. He wants him to be an employment counselor. Hobson said, man, I ain't no employment counselor. I'm the cat going to take your business from him if you don't do what I said. <laughs> well, Hobson changed his, I mean, uh, Bruce Hunt changed their policy too. Then did you know that the Washington Hospital Center would not accept any black folks unless you had a white doctor? 
so we decided to take them on next. We went up there one Saturday, and we, we usually worked on Saturdays because you get more people who weren't working, you know. I mean, we usually picketed on Saturdays. So we had our big signs. There was one of our um, lady picketers who had a little puppy dog about that, that size. And she had made a picket sign, picket blanket that she wrapped around in. And she was parading up and down with it. So then after we picketed about two hours, Hobson said, all right, folks, let's go inside. Then we're going to lay down in the lobby, and we're going to stay there until he changed his policy, <laughs> which we did. The manager came out and said, now, who's responsible for all this? Hobson said, well, I I'm the person who's trying to get y'all to do the right thing, you know. Well, what's the right thing, Mr. Hurd? You need to let people in this hospital even if they don't have a white doctor. Well, Mr. Mr. Hobson, I don't set the policies here, you know. Well, who does? Well, the manager is, is, is in New York. Well, get him down here. We'll wait. We'll wait. <laughs> Mr. Hobson. You're going to have to remove these people, or else I'm going to have, you, you're trespassing. I'm going to have to call the police. I was just said, man, that's all right. That's all right. We've got plenty of people. We've been back here plenty of times. So they called the police, and they get us all out. I was just said, now, Charlie, don't, don't, don't you, I want you to go down to the, to the court and bail us out on Monday, you know. So that's what happened quite often. Because <laughs> I was presentable looking, you know, and dressed properly and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I used to be the male, <laughs> male person. But anyway, that's the, uh, and, and uh, oh yes, so we went to court. Because at that time the federal government was giving money to various institutions, especially hospitals. But you weren't supposed to discriminate if you're getting federal money. So we went to court to challenge them, and they changed the policy right away because they weren't going to get any more federal money. And that's the way we function all over town. Okay. Um, when you did these actions, how did people find out about them? Did the newspapers cover them? Oh, yes. Well, there were two African-American newspapers at the time, the Afro-American and the Tribune. Tribune's office was down on 9th Street, right next to the police station between 9th and, on U Street, between 9th and 10th. And uh, they gave us plenty of publicity, but, it, but the, the, the Star and the Post and the Times were covering that, too. I mean, this was, these rabble-rousers, you know, you have to report that, you know. So it got to be quite a, quite a thing. Um, in... I'm just thinking, Walter Washington became the mayor. Well, this is what, this is much later, much later. Did, did some of these actions, I mean, with Hobson making these statements, did, uh, did the people who were following him have great confidence in him, or did they say, oh my God, what did he just say there? <laughs> well, there was an element of the professional black community that was mm -hmm. embarrassed, mm -hmm. shame, you know. We, Besides, we all have relationships. Why, why can't we get along? You know, we've been our place and you'll be in your place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, more and more African Americans were beginning to join, mm -hmm. especially since right thinking white people were joining too, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, we became quite popular. <laughs> and um, we got arrested. Re regularly mm -hmm. and um, James Farmer by the way became disenchanted with Hobson yes. he felt that Hobson was getting a bit too obstructionist mm -hmm. so he fired him from the Congress of Racial Equality mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so Hobson formed his own organization I'm trying to think what it was called now yeah, I, I can't think of what it should. Yeah, I, but we went right on <laughs> with with a new name. Um, there was a uh, 
automobile dealer at I think Georgia Avenue and Shepherd Street. And Hobson decided to take him on because he wouldn't hire any blacks. So he went in there. And when he talked to the guy about it, he says, Oh, we've got black people. Get Sam out here. Mm -hmm. Sam came up with the room. He was a janitor. See? Mm -hmm. So Hobson says, I think you need to hire yourself. And he says, Now, you know, we've got a lot of taxi cab owners in this city, and they buy. Let them buy their cabs from you. Now, if you won't hire no black folks, man, I'm just going to tell them, don't buy. You see, see the signs out there? Okay. And that worked, too. So the guy called Hobson one day and <laughs> asked him to come up. So he had hired a black man as a salesperson. But the interesting thing is that he was parading this guy back and forth before the show window, so it was clear that he had a black man a guy with... <laughs> with the notepads and so forth. <laughs> but anyway, that's, that's the way we function. Were you involved with the uh, uh, actions at the Hans Shoe Store and other department stores? Uh... No, I wasn't involved at, at, uh, in, at Hans in particular, but I'm, I'm aware of it. Um, gee, there were so many of them. <laughs> it was, oh, there was one thing. Um, after the president was appointing the commissioners for Washington, D.C., and they were always white, mm -hmm. and one of them was always a uh, member of the Army Air Corps, uh, the Army Engineers Corps. Um, he was in charge of the construction in, in the city. Um, There was a program to get rid of rodents in Ward 3, mostly Georgetown, as I recall. And so we prevailed upon them to do the same thing in our community, and they just didn't have enough money for it. So Hobson decided that he was going to have a... <laughs> campaign to distribute rats in the white community. Did you hear about that? Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. And he, um, we had a, had a big rally down at uh, what is now the Freedom Plaza. Uh, Huffman used to have, have rallies regularly before we'd go out on these missions to tell people what we're going to do and, and get as many people to come with us. And at, at our rallies, they always had policemen surrounding us, you know, uh, for intimidation or whatever. So Hobson would talk about, you know, so we're going to get some rats. And, uh, anybody, anybody know somebody with a truck? Well, we need a lot of trucks to take these rats out at Georgetown. And uh, so... That, that that's I think he got started, but they stopped him because the commissioners decided that they were going to do that in in our city. But one of the interesting things is, if we had a crowd of four or five thousand people, there may be fifty cops lining surrounding us. And Hobson used to go up to a cop and says, "Ah." Uh, uh, how long you been on the force, man? And the guy wouldn't answer, you know. He says, I noticed you wearing a gun there. You ever use that gun? The guy wouldn't answer. He said, well, I said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself working in a segregated thing like that, you know? And he just talked to him like that. Now, the purpose was to get black folks not to be afraid of these guys. You see, I can, I can ain't doing nothing to me. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't do anything to him because there's too many other black folks around. <laughs> be a riot. <laughs> but that's, that's the way we function. Did it work? Huh? Did it work? Did that succeed in getting black people to not be so afraid of cops? When oh, yes. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. In fact, it got to be kind of a, an, um, an honor to have been arrested. 
You been arrested? Yeah, sure. Just the last week, man. <laughs> for a good cause, for a decent cause. One of the things you were uh, involved in was the uh, the anti freeway fight, North Central Freeway, and all the other freeways, and the mm -hmm. Three Sisters Bridge, etc. And with the emergency committee uh, on the uh, transportation crisis, yeah. and. Um, Tell a little about that and the people you worked with on that. I'd like to hear what you thought of Pope Julius, Sammy Abbott, uh, some of the other mm -hmm. uh, people, Reggie Booker, mm -hmm. etc. Um, well, Sammy Abbott was was a, <laughs> a, he was even stronger than Hobson. <laughs> Sammy Abbott was the kind of person who would go to a city council meeting and. After the meeting got started, he would stand up and said, look, I got something important to talk about. You know, this stuff, you, I got something. Sir, you better sit down. No, no, I'm going to sit down, not going to sit down. And then they'd call the guards. The guards would carry him away, you know. And Sammy would do that on a regular basis. But Sammy organized uh, his uh, community in Tacoma, was it? Yeah. Tacoma? Tacoma. Tacoma, yeah, in fact, he became the mayor of Tacoma. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And he was with us on so many of these things, you know. He was he was a tough little guy. Mm -hmm. We we all respected him very much. Um when they decided well they'd been building freeways for quite a while now. But then they decided that they were gonna build one right up through Brooklyn. So um, we formed the Emergency Committee on the Trans Transportation Crisis to ask the government to put no more funds in this because they want to destroy a black community. And of course, nobody's paying any attention to us. So uh, we started to picketing a part of that was the Three Sisters Bridge, as I recall. And we went down to the Three Sisters Bridge and they had fenced it in and they had um, had uh, dogs, you know, that would challenge you, you know. So we just surrounded the place and wouldn't let them. Wouldn't let them get. If 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 we can't get inside, then the workers can't get inside either. <laughs> but anyway, we had regular meetings in Sammy Abbott's office then, upon Connecticut Avenue, as I recall. That's right, the Dupont Circle Building. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. He'd done some good research. He um, he designed the the incredible poster, two of the. Uh, white men's roads to black men's houses. Oh, yes. And yes. Uh, I wish I had a copy of it. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, anyway, we, um, let's see, I think that was when they had uh, confiscated some houses that were in the path yes. of this freeway. Right. Boarded them up. So, uh, we weren't the only ones involved in this. I mean, this has gotten to be uh, a pretty popular event. So we had a bunch of people who unboarded the houses and they were ready immediately to go in and start repairing and painting, you know, so that it looked more constructive, you know. And I can't think of the name of the police chief at the time. Was it Wilson? Jerry Wilson, was he the chief at the time? Could have been. Yeah. Anyway, I remember he came he came up there himself and we were inside one of these houses with a bullhorn. Said, You come out, come out of here, we're gonna arrest you, you know. And we kept arrest we kept working, you know. But it was finally getting a little embarrassing because there were so many white people who were a part of these mm -hmm. bad people. <laughs> Um, how do we get them to stop that freeway? 
it was bad publicity. I don't know what the well, I know maybe the federal government was putting some money into that. It was there was, there was a lot of things going. There was court challenges. Yeah. There was, mm -hmm. uh, the push to build metro, I mean, that was coming from mm -hmm. that direction. Yeah. Uh, we talked, um, uh, yeah, so there was, a, we talked to uh, Angela Rooney, we probably know from those days. And she, yeah, she, she and her husband were active. That's right, Tom. Yeah. And they were uh, pointing out that people who in later years moved into the community that they would meet and say, by the way, the house you're living in was once boarded up and was going to be destroyed. <laughs> so a lot of people got together. Yeah, right. those, were, those were the days. Why, why do you think, uh, I mean, the, it's often been remarked about what an amazing coalition where you had black, white, poor, rich, uh, reactionary. Oh, well, uh, you know, there's right, there's right thinking white people. They're not all bad, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, that's supposed to make you laugh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Bennett, uh, a couple of things, I guess, were happening roughly around the, the same time you uh, ran and were elected to the first uh, school board, board of education, and you were also uh, with Julius Hobson and others uh, initiating the uh, the D.C. statehood party. Uh, talk a little about both of us. What, mm -hmm. what prompted you to run for the, the school board? Uh, and well, those of us who uh, had been active in the civil rights activities were getting a lot of publicity, and we were all well known. So, uh, Drew just ran for the uh, school board, and he was elected. I ran for the school board and I was elected when I served from 70 to 74, I believe. While I was on the school board, I decided that since so much of the tax money in Washington, D.C. came from the African-American community, that we should be getting more of the contracts. And as an architect, I was particularly sensitive about the fact that the, the commissions to design schools or to make repairs or extensions of schools were not going to any black folks. So I established the D.C. Council of Black Architects. And I guess that was maybe 72. All the black architects joined it. In fact, to be presumptuous, I had my meetings in the same room that the school board's meeting. On one occasion, now my father had a relationship with uh, Walter Washington since he was doing, he did um, the James Creek housing development in Southwest and so forth. And he did a couple of school additions. But anyway, I mention that because the women who were on welfare at Washington, D.C. were getting a certain amount of money, but there were other kinds of money that they were supposed to get. I don't remember just what it was, different programs. And these women weren't getting that. So, I don't believe Hobson was involved in this. We decided to go see Walter Washington and to go to his office. We took about, you know, 20, 25 people to his office to demand that these women get this money that the D.C. government is giving to some people, right? But as we're walking into Walter's office. Whom should I see sitting there waiting to see him but my father? And he was a very prim and proper person. You know. He um, dressed all of his clothes were black. Black shoes, black socks, black suits, black ties, and black hat. The only thing not black were white shirts, right? So to see me with going in here, now he has, he, he had to wait to see the mayor. 
We weren't waiting. We were going to the office. We want to see the man. Are you not here now? Okay, we sit down and wait, you know. <laughs> uh, the mayor never came, but we left our demands with him. And when I went out, when we went back, my father wasn't there anymore. I dreaded, I didn't want to embarrass him anyway. You know. I'm glad he wasn't there. <laughs> But he accepted the fact that his son was a rabble rouser now. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Did, but when you were on the school board, uh, well, and you would have encountered him, of course, throughout the 60s, uh, Marion Barry, what, what are your recollections of him as a school board member, as an activist, as a, you know, what, did you have many dealings with him? Well, I was elected to the school board in 1970. At that time, Barry had formed an organization. Maybe you remember the name of that organization. To get Pride, yeah. Pride, yes. And I think he, he established that long before his, um, the school board. Mm -hmm. But since he was well known then, mm -hmm. there was the elections for the school board were every two years. Your term was four years, but you elected every two years. I mean, new people were brought on every two years. And Barry ran in the middle of the term that I was, I 72, I believe, right? Um, I don't remember that, that, that Marion was all that active. Marion was deeply involved in and concerned with politics. And he felt that what you ought to do is establish relationships among these people so you can get things done, you know. Establish relationships with congressmen and so forth. So he and I think I think had some minor conflicts when I was demanding that certain things be done, especially in the construction of schools. That's my field, you know. And he thought that we should be gentlemen. <laughs> but uh, eventually, you know, Marion Rand became mayor. And to jump forward a little bit, you remember when the Verizon Center was being built? Sure. It wasn't called that then. I forget what it was called. Oh, yeah, yeah. what was the, uh, yeah, it was... It wasn't Convention Center. It was, uh, Sprint. 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 Or it had another name. Yeah, it was okay. World, it was the thing that really went bankrupt. World... Yes, World yes. Com. Yeah, uh -huh. that's right, yeah. Well, uh, Barry, of course, was very much in favor mm -hmm. of uh, cooperating, you know? Mm -hmm. Incidentally, I jumped ahead too fast. I had become, <laughs> I'm sorry, um, I became the chair of the D.C. Historic Preservation Review Board. And I was appointed by Mayor, what was the, what was the lady's name? Sharon, Sharon, Sharon Kelly. Kelly, Sharon Pratt Kelly, yeah. right. Now, prior to that, oh yeah, Barry appointed me to the Historic Preservation Review Board. There was a little guy working for him, I can't remember his name, but he said, look, to keep Charlie from being so obstructive and opposing you and so much, give him a position, put him on some, what, put him on a review, pre Historic Preservation Review Board. Mm -hmm which I like being on. So I went on the Historic Preservation Review Board. While I was on the review board, I always took the position of the communities. I was in favor of the communities as opposed to the developers who want to tear something down, you know, or who wanted to make some unapproved changes. So I got a reputation among the communities. When Sharon Pratt Kelly came into office, there was, I guess, I hear that there were large numbers of people who were putting pressure on her, make Cassell the chairman, and she did. So I became chair of the Historic Preservation Review Board from 93 to 96. Barry was the 
chairman all through my service there. And he called me into his office one day. He said, Charlie, I want to talk to you. So you know they're getting ready to build that uh, building over on the 7th Street. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people opposing it, man, you know. A lot of people don't really see what benefit it'll be. You know? How you stand on it, Charlie? I said, well, man, you know, I'm first of all, that's a historic district. I mean, there's four or five very classic buildings in that. And I don't think we should be putting something new and uncharacteristic in that neighborhood. Are you sure about that? I said, yeah, yeah, I've already taken that position. <laughs> okay, Charlie. So when my term was up, he didn't reappoint me. <laughs> what he was telling me is, if you want to be reappointed, you're going to have to go home with it. <laughs> Let me back you up to the yes, uh, formation of the, the statehood party. I know Julian yeah. Thompson had a view that home rule was home fool. Mm -hmm. called. Was that your view also? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Well, home rule simply meant that you could elect your mayor and you could elect the city council. But everything that they did had to be approved by the Congress. Yeah. So we didn't have self-government, and we had no representation in the Congress, no representatives, no sellers. That's why Hobson called it home fool. It's fooling people into think that they've got a government. So he and Josephine Butler and Hilda Mason and um, Reginald Booker and people like that decided the only way for us to get rid of this non-representative government is to become a state just like everybody else. Of course. Mm -hmm. So let's become a state. What do we have to do? Well, we'll form a statehood party and we will run candidates for office. Okay, so we formed a statehood party. Uh, Julius was an officer. I was an officer. In fact, the names I mentioned were, were, were officers. You know? And uh, we started a campaigning. Oh, yeah, uh, Sammy Abbott was a part of that, too. Sammy Abbott was the one who used to go with us to city council meetings, you know, and demand, we've got something important to, to talk about, you know. Sir, sir, you'll have to sit down. You have to say, no, no, I'm not ready to sit down, man. <laughs> so Sammy got arrested several times, right. as the rest of us did. But uh, he, he uh, gained some renown. And I think that's why he was elected the mayor of Tacoma Park, <laughs> because he was, doing, he was taking strong positions about the incursions into that neighborhood of developers. Does that sound right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. When you mentioned some of the people, uh, Josephine Butler was a pretty amazing woman. I uh, just wanted to put your assessment of her. Well, she was a member of the Statehood Party, and she was right along with everybody else. I don't remember anything specific that she did, except that she was a hard worker. I think at one point she started some organization uh, over on New Jersey Avenue. What was it now? But it had to do with gaining our rights. But I don't know. I don't think that organization last, lasted very long. Do you remember? Yeah, not, not offhand. I know a number of things she was active with, but I mean, and certainly... Well, you know, tell me some of them. Maybe it'll so, bring back some uh, number. Certainly, like the Paul Robeson uh, yeah, Paul Society, uh, Society, she was very yeah. much uh, uh, involved in that, in the sort of in the cultural, political yeah. sphere. Yeah, do they have an office. I don't think so. Just wondering whether that was. Um, yeah, and of course, then Hobson was elected as a statehood uh, member of the council, and subsequently, mm -hmm. Hilda Mason uh, filled his seat. Well, while Hobson, as soon as he became elected. He introduced 
uh, legislation for statehood. Mm-hmm. And it was Hobson's thing, right? Okay. Um, at that time, the whole movement for black folks to assert themselves and remove some of these restrictions was such. Hobson was a very popular city council member. As a matter of fact, the rest of the city council didn't want to oppose him when he called for statehood. So they passed it, even though was the mayor, the mayor was Walter Washington, Walter, Washington, yeah. Walter Washington at that time. Now, one thing that occurs to me, how come the Congress didn't overrule that? The, at hmm. the time, you know, um, Ted Kennedy in the Senate and yes. Fred Schwengel in the House mm-hmm. introduced statehood. That's right, yeah. I, do you have a copy of Ted, Ted Kennedy's? Introduction statement. So maybe that. Mm-hmm. So I have a copy of it if you want. Okay. Yeah. So that. So I, I assume the Hobson thing was probably just a, a resolution rather than mm-hmm. law. So maybe they didn't touch resolutions. Or something. Yeah. Well, it became the city council passed the resolution, and the mayor mayor must have approved it. As, as you went up through the uh, 70s and, uh, and in the, the early 80s, the, there was an initiative to uh, hold a constitutional convention, uh, mm-hmm. and subsequently that convention was held, and you were the, the, you the chairman or the president. The D.C. Statehood Constitutional, constitutional Convention okay. was the, uh, in fact, I think that was a part of Hobson's legislation. Mm-hmm. I yeah, that's yeah, and all of us who had been active those days, including Hobson and and Hilda and Josephine, um, were involved in the statehood movement. Right. Once we formed the D.C. Statehood Constitutional Convention, then we had to elect officers. Hilda's name was mentioned. My name was mentioned. I don't know why Hobson wasn't inf- involved in that. He, he died by then. Had he died then? 77. Yeah. I know, yeah, he was, yeah. he'd been sick for a while, too. Um, so, in determining who should be chair, the feeling was that Hilda was not forceful enough. She was a gentleman. Besides, she was married to this white guy. Hmm. <laughs> Charlie. Yes, right. Charlie Mason. Charlie Mason was a good guy. He p- put a lot of money into all of our campus. You know, he's a, a sign of the Mason Jar family. And uh, he was very supportive of Hilda, very supportive of all of the activities he came to. Law School. Yeah, mm-hmm. And he kept records in his pockets anytime Hilda would forget it, any time. Uh, uh, yeah, he'll don't forget anything. He plucked. And bus schedules too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Charlie was was a good guy, but anyway, my reputation was such that I was a go getter. So they they elected me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Besides, I wasn't afraid to get arrested. There were. Um, I, I don't know how many people on the council, but the, the council, D.C., the city council, in a way, threw obstacles in your way by not giving you enough funding, as I recall, mm-hmm. and limiting it to 90 days, I think it was. You had to come up with a yeah. constitution. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think Betty Ann Kane, I think, was the council member who was saying, we don't want to spend too much money on this. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, well, But still, at the end, what did you produce? You produced a, a well. <laughs> they gave us ninety days and two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which was much shorter time than all the other states had to write their constitutions. 
and much less money than other states. But we were determined, since that's what we had, and this was an opportunity. We wrote that Constitution in 90 days. What we did was to get copies of the Constitutions from all the other states and take what we could from them, but yet we pointed out certain things, you know, no discrimination whatsoever. And we had several controversial things. Uh, since I was telling you, since I rested 105, you know, I, I can't remember everything. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. But the, um, as I recall, the, uh, as it was typical, the Washington Post was dead opposed to that Constitution and uh, urged its defeat by the, the voters. And I think when you mentioned about Confort, they, they, I think, zeroed in on this guarantee of a job or something that was, that was a provision in there. Yes. Which mm -hmm. was, uh, uh, <laughs> that was everybody's constitutional right as a, as a citizen. Uh, the, but the Constitution was approved by the, by the voters. Then. Yes, it was. We did a lot of campaigning mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> practically the whole business community was against it. They, they campaigned against it, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, but we were pretty good campaigners. We s went throughout the neighborhoods. We knocked on doors. We did everything. Said, this is our chance now. This is our chance. We are the only American citizens who have to pay a local tax and a federal tax and be drafted into the service, but we don't have any representation. We got to have the statehood, right? Everybody agreed. And at the same time, there had been the the Walter Fauntroy effort to get uh, representation in Congress, but the states weren't state legislatures weren't ratifying that. Yeah, well, that. you know, I, I don't. The general opinion that he was a part of the system and didn't really fight hard, you know. He did hold a, a couple of uh, hearings, one that I attended, that were supportive of our ideas. But beyond that, you know, he wouldn't make a case like uh, some others would. That uh, constitutional commitment, the, the, the Constitution, uh, I mean, even just in broad terms, uh, I think it was praised as the most progressive political document ever uh, ever tendered in the... Uh, well, that's because it had no consideration for politics or for the status quo, you know? Just one other thing about that convention is I remember somebody that I knew uh, that it got pretty heated at times, mm -hmm. as I recall. In fact, toward, fights. Toward the end. I oh, I don't remember any well, fist no, fights. the guy that I knew, I mean, it was very embarrassing. <laughs> he was a man who punched out a, a woman. Really? <laughs> was, who was that? It was, well, I don't want to mention it on camera. <laughs> <laughs> he, I mean, he was very embarrassed. He didn't punch her, he sort of shoved her. It was, uh, 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 Well, I was a chairman. I would never have stood for that. <laughs> maybe, well, no, maybe this may have been during a break or something. <laughs> It was a statehood member shoving a Republican woman. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, there were some Republican uh, convention members who were not as enthusiastic as yes. the rest of us were. In fact, do you remember David Clark? Yeah. Sure. Who was, uh, he, he voted against it. Against the Constitution? At the convention? Mm -hmm. I didn't remember that. There were... Uh, I guess there were two or three of the Republican whites. If you don't remember it, maybe it wasn't David. David Clark wasn't... I'd be surprised, yeah. He, he wasn't assertive like the rest of them. He, he questioned a lot of the things. That, yeah, he's very much the lawyer on that. Maybe, maybe I'm not, not being correct. Can woman, you cut that out? There was a woman... Um, I won't mention the last thing. I think the Republican woman that was big against it, Gloria something. 
Oh, yeah, Gloria Cohen? Yeah, I think that's right, yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, so uh, and just to close the loop on that, though, up to the present, in the last several years, at least, it seems there's been a resurgent interest in uh, state. There's even bills up on uh, Capitol Hill that, I don't know, 17 or 20, 25 House members yeah. have signed up. We hear three or four senators. Mm -hmm. And you've been involved in, uh, in all mm -hmm. that. We even got uh, our delegate to introduce the statehood. Yes. Remember? Yes. And uh, we got the city council to establish a statehood commission. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we had to really, really lean on them to fund it. It hasn't been funded properly yet. Did they fund the shadow uh, offices? There, there was some bill to, for the shadow rep. I, uh, I think so. Yeah, yeah I said, uh, shadow center, Senate is one senator and two representatives. Uh, it's other way. Two, two senators, one. Two senators, one. yeah, same as yeah. yeah. Michael Brown is one of them. No. The other Michael Brown. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he's one of the senators. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, in in oh, one thing. I'm sorry, and I. We, I did say we would talk a little a bit about jazz, and I think maybe we oh, yes. or keep you here for too many hours. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know. Can you cut that off for a moment again? Detail. You know, this is going to go into an archive. You know, did John tell you that? No. Um, we want to get a collection of video interviews, oral interviews, materials, things like that, for an archive for people who are going to be researching this period historically since oh. 75. And George Washington University has invited us to have our archive there. So oh. it's real. <laughs> yeah. it'll, take a, it'll take four or five years probably to get it all together. Mm -hmm. right? but, but that's where it's eventually going. So. Well, I hope I live to see it then. Yes, well, maybe sooner, maybe a couple. Uh, we, we talked earlier uh, about your early uh, uh, interest in uh, uh, jazz and uh, uh, your father being against it, your mother having a more uh, tolerant uh, attitude about it, and that developed into sort of a lifelong uh, uh, passion uh, mm -hmm. for, for jazz. And um, Do you have that uh, folder that I... I have a folder with... Oh, oh, a lot of, black, yeah, yeah, black I guess, folder. yeah, black, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That, uh, well, just, just when you're young, you, <laughs> before you even get into the, the, uh, No, it's black. The, the society, uh, you, uh, thinks, uh, I think have, in articles I've read, talked about, of course, seeing performers at the old, uh, uh Howard Theater. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little about that, who you, and, and some of the jazz clubs that, were around in, in your uh, old time in the forties. No, I'm just looking for that uh, folder. Let me see I thought Linda said she was going to put it on the table. Yeah, that's it. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Give it to him. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Excuse me, uh, Eddie. Yeah. Who? Who? Uh, in, in those days, was when you go to the Howard Theater. Of course, they had other performers besides uh, jazz performers. Were you? Seeing mainly jazz. Uh, yeah, Howard Theater was mainly yeah. jazz and yeah. popular music. Right, right. Um, people like Billy Holiday and Ella Fitzgerald used to appear there mm -hmm. on a regular basis, mm -hmm. and uh, it was considered jazz. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> we saw some great shows there at the Howard Theater. For instance, now my mother wasn't too happy about my going there because they had uh, <clears throat> chorus lines with ladies with practically no clothes on, you know, and she didn't think that would be healthy for me. But that wasn't what I was interested in. The Howard Theater used to, the show would begin on a Friday and go through the next Thursday. It started at one o'clock in the afternoon. Sometimes I used to cut school and get to that one o'clock opening 
It cost all of 40 cents. Mm -hmm. 40 cents. Mm -hmm. A show at the, th a, a performance at the Howard Theater would begin this way. There would be previews of the coming attractions. Then there might be a comedy. Then there might be um, the newsreel. This is before the days of television. And you got your movie news through the movie theater. Lowell, Lowell Thomas, I think, was one of the major ones. And uh, that would go on for a while, so that would be comedy. Oh, then a, a serial, a Tom Mix serial. And then the feature movie, Gone with the Wind or whatever. When all of those were over, the lights would go out, and then there would be a light on the curtain on the stage, a beautiful crimson colored stage. And from the bottom of the curtain to the floor of the stage might be that much space so that we could see the feet walking around of the men in the orchestra, the people who were going to perform. And if I had a buddy with me, we would argue as to who's he to, hey man, that's, that's Fats Waller. No man, that's not Fats Waller, that's, that's, that's Erskine and Hawkins for him. <coughs> Finally, and the curtain would open and there would be this magnificent band standing there and the guy's all dressed up and you see all these instruments, shiny instruments, trumpets, trombones, saxophone and so forth. And whoever the leader was sitting at the piano and then they'd start to play. Wow, that was great. And it's the loudest but undisturbing music you'd ever hear, you know. And then would be an MC. It used to be MC named Willie Bryan. He used to travel with uh, many of these uh, bands. But the, he would introduce the the orchestra and the orchestra leader, and the orchestra leader might say something, and then they'd play another couple of numbers. And then there would be a comedian like Red Fox. Remember him from TV? He started out just as a stage comedian, you know? And he would tell lots of jokes, some of them a little colorful. And then after that would come on the singer, Ella Fitzgerald. And these women, whether they were good looking or not, they were so dressed and so personable that they were really exciting, you know. And she'd do her part. And when that was over, the curtain would close. What I remember was, you know the name Pearl Bailey? Mm -hmm. Pearl Bailey used to perform there too. She had a brother named Bill Bailey, who was, I think, a, a dancer. But anyway, Pearl Bailey was a real show-off. When she performed, she came in from the back. And she would have a long trail dress, like a wedding gown. You know, as long as that sofa there. And there would be a couple of little girls carrying it at the end, you know. And the... And the uh, Orchestra would be playing, da 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 you know. Sometimes she would stop and look at somebody in the audience, talk to them. So I was with my buddy on this one occasion. I said, boy, I wish she would stop and talk to me, man. Boy, would I be something, watch what I'll do. <laughs> As it happened, she actually did stop and sat on my lap. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> I was not cool at all. <laughs> How old were you? Huh? How old were you in this? Oh, I guess about 14, 15. 
So then she got up and then she looked, there was a woman sitting, no, I guess there was a woman sitting next to me. I guess it was me and a girlfriend and a guy and a girlfriend, yeah. So Pearl looked at that woman and says, you with him, man? She says, no. She says, all right, because I'll tell you, what he looked at, the way he looked at me and the way he touched me, you, you won't be careful of him. I didn't touch her at all. <laughs> then she proceeded on down the aisle, started up the steps of the stage, and then reached back to her hips. And, oh, I don't think I could make it up there. Y'all mind if I perform right here? <laughs> And she performed half the program, sitting on the steps. And then uh, the band leader came out and said, well, Miss Bailey, why didn't you ask for some help? Come on, y'all. And he called about five guys from the band. They all helped her on the stage. And she uh, told a few jokes, talked about her brother, Bill Bailey. And then that was that one. But. Uh, there was a, all the, the, the nice thing about the Howard is, whereas we uh, people of color couldn't go to the theaters downtown, we didn't have to because all the good stuff was coming uptown at the Howard Theater. As a matter of fact, some of the white folks used to come up to the Howard Theater to see shows that didn't go that didn't go downtown, and we didn't discriminate against them. Nah, come on in, y'all. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I really enjoyed the Howard Theater because we saw all of the popular people, Erskine Hawkins. Um, there was even one white band, the only white band that ever came there, his name was Georgie Old, A-U-L-D. And he was good, too. Did you ever meet any of these uh, people, personally meet them uh, in later years uh, when you were starting out? Um, well, when, when we were producing ourselves, yeah, yes. we, we met a lot of them. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so tell us about that, about the uh, mm -hmm. Jazz Society and what, how it got its name. And well... <laughs> I started an organ in 1977. I started an organization called the Jazz Art Society. And what we did was to hire all the local musicians and put them on the stage, right? And that was going pretty good. We Trying to think of the name of some of the well, we were using small, small places, and um, finally I was doing one called um, Three Pianos with Three Pianists. John Eaton, who's still f performing in Washington D.C., Kirk Stewart, who was the pianist for Sarah Vaughan and an African named Ndiko Saba. And he was a revolutionary. He used to play the piano like he was in the revolution. But I used to have, used to advertise in a newsletter, and that newsletter went as far as Baltimore. And one day a lady called me up and she says, my name is Linda Wernick. She says, I see by this newsletter that you're going to have Kirk Stewart, who plays for Sarah Vaughan? I said, yes, yes. She says, oh, good, good. Then I'll, I, I'm going to come. I said, well, thank you very much. i look for you. I forgot about it. At the event, the three pianists played, and then at the intermission, I'm standing up front talking to some of my clients, you know, when somebody taps me on the back, you know. Mm -hmm. So hello. She says, hello. I'm Linda Wernick. Remember I talked to you from the, uh, from Baltimore? She said, oh, yes, yes. Well, thank you very much for coming. She says, and there's my sister and her boyfriend in the audience, too, you know. Yes. Okay. Then I went back to talking to my 
I had to keep looking back. That was a good looking, personable woman. Ooh! I couldn't concentrate now. I kept looking back, you know. And there wasn't a loser in the audience, you know. So when it was over, I went and sat down and talked to her. And I said, uh, we're going to have something in Baltimore uh, a couple of weeks. I said, will you come to that? And she said, yeah, I'll come to it. So don't wait, wait a minute, I'm getting mixed up now. The Jazz Art Society never left out, never left town. I invited her to the next few Jazz Art Society events, you know. So she told me about her interest in jazz. She was the director of student affairs at Goucher College, and as such, she had a budget so that she could hire various entertainers from time to time, and she had hired people like. Kirk Stewart and Sarah Vaughan. So she started to come into my apartment to plan with me my Jazz Art Society things. The Jazz Art Society was getting grants from the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities and from the National Endowment Arts. But the people who were working with me were more interested in the money. They weren't really jazz enthusiasts, you know? Mm -hmm. So the two of us said, why don't we form our own organization? Yeah, why not? What do we call it? Lynn Char? No, that doesn't sound right. Charles and Charlin. That's how's that about? Okay, that's what it'll be. And we had our first event at. Um, See, my wife should be here now because she can remember. But anyway, we had two or three events, and we used the different local musicians. Mm -hmm. And we became kind of popular. One of the guys who was on the D.C. Commission on the Arts and Humanities said to us, why don't you take your things up to Northwest to the Ithaca Society at 16th and... Albemarle, she said, yeah, that's the Ethical Society. They, they, they don't have any chance to it. He said, you can, you can rent in their space. So we went up there, and then we decided to hire a musician named Buck Hill. Buck Hill was a saxophonist who was a, a mailman. And he spent his mornings in the post office. We went to see him somewhere. We were so impressed with him when we decided we'd hire him for our next event. Then we spread the news and we gave, there were, we were getting good, good representation, good uh, notice in the media. Um, there were two or three uh, uh, columnists who used to write about jazz. I'll think of it in a minute. But anyway, they indicated that uh, the Charlotte Jazz Society was having Buck Hill this week, and then they did a spread on Buck Hill. And they showed him practicing his, practicing his saxophone in a room in the post office and so forth. Gave, gave us a good, good write-up. So we had at the Ethical Society a line around the corner, first time. So we had maybe our next 10 or 12 events there. But then we started to engaging renowned people, you know? Um, you'll see the, the names of their flyers in there for uh, many concerts. And um, we started bringing in big crowds. Tito Fuente. Yeah, we had Tito Fuente and... Oh, I didn't see that. Yeah. Um, just at this, at this point, were you, had you, were you married then? Yes, I was. Is it, in, in, 
I was married to, let's see now. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Because you were talking about the promotion book before. Yeah, you just had met her. we started in, the, I met her in 79, December 70, November, November the 29th, 79, and 29 is a magic number for us. Um, and we did this for, until 1982, wow. yeah, 1982 we got married, on November the 29th. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we had been producing concerts by then. And she was trying, coming to my apartment regularly. She'd come from Baltimore, and I'd pick her up at the Union Station yeah. and, and bring her back to my apartment. We'd go to the performance, and then I'd take her back to the Union Station, and she'd go on back to Baltimore, where she had a job. Finally... Um, We started to having renowned people like um, Dizzy Gillespie. Now we had to have something special in order to get them. So I decided it's time for us to declare that jazz is a hundred years old and have a jazz centennial. And we'll have it at the Kennedy Center, you know. And we did that, and boy, did we have a crowd. We filled up the, the concert hall at the uh, Kennedy Center holds 2,500 people. And with the advertisement from the newspapers, not paid advertisements, but the columns written by, there were two columnists that used to write, Alice Bonner was one Alice of them. Bonner. Alice Bonner. Alice Bonner. Yeah. 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 Uh, there's an article in there by her somewhere. And um, we got such good notice that we were able to fill up the concert hall. That was a wonderful night. For, oh, yes, it was. Yeah. Then we decided, well, now, in April 1999, Duke Ellington would have been 100 years old had he lived. I think he only lived to be 74. So we had decided to have a Duke Ellington Centennial. We had that at the concert hall. Dizzy Gillespie came to that. And we had uh, the MC for that was another prominent person, prominent on TV and radio. And they came not because of us, they came because of the people we were having. Uh, I can't find the name. Yeah, it's probably another thing conducted by Kip Ellington. That's probably in here. <laughs> yeah. By Mercer Ellington. I yeah. should have. Yeah, yeah Mercy. Well, we had Mercer Ellington after Ellington died. Yeah. And uh, he had the Ellington band. And we had the uh, Nicholas Brothers oh. on the stage with Mercer Ellington. Nicholas Brothers, the tap dancers? Yeah, the two of them, yeah. In fact, were there two or three? Two. One just died this last Yeah, year. okay. Bear, yeah. But they were good entertainers. They told jokes as well as danced, you know. Seeing them dance, amazing. Linda, what's the name of uh, the, the trumpeter whose name I can't think of? You mean Louis Armstrong? No. That's the Satchmo Award. No, no. Is that the Satch? That's. Yeah, we created a Satchmo Award and gave it to Winston Marsalis. Winston, I was thinking of Winston Marsalis, but that wasn't from Winston Marsalis. Yeah, it was. Uh, I thought so. That yeah, you know the name Winston yeah, Marsalis. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, he performed for us on a couple of occasions, and we had a tribute to Louis Armstrong, which was. Great. We had a lot of fun with that. You've been into jazz for a long time, haven't you? Yes, mm -hmm. since I was in, in, in elementary school. I was listening to Duke Ellington those days. And we did a celebration of Duke Ellington's 100th birthday here in Washington. 
at the Kennedy Center. I'm only 88 years old now. I mean, he was, he was, he would have been 100 in 1995. You see. So he was a little bit before my time. Well, yeah, but he could have still been. Oh, well, he could have come to Washington. In fact, I saw him perform a couple of times at the um, um, Wolf Trap. Uh -huh. And once he performed, I was surprised, at a YMCA here on stage. And I remember I was in the balcony of that YMCA. But he was, he was quite a cruises we had. We used to have a jazz. Found it right here. Yes. 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 Yes every year was to have a cruise on the Potomac, which we call the Jazz Cruise on the Potomac. And they were a lot of fun. <laughs> but I remember once the uh, boat that we were on, it's one of those big, yeah. what do you call them? Cruisers. Yeah. The ones Two or three stories, stories right? Yeah. 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 And it ran aground. <laughs> And they had to call somebody to get them off. Well, we had Nap Turner singing for us then. You know that name? Sure. Yeah. Nap Turner. I think he's passed on now. Yes, he has. Um, one of the other things that uh, the Charlotte Jazz Society used to do was to bring into the high schools renowned composers who um, taught students how to compose as well as sing. And that was great. We had one group of students from the Cardoza High School whom we took to the Kennedy Center. And they performed in the, on the Millennium Stage, which is out in the lobby there. Right. Right. And after that performance, then they went to the National Public Radio recording studios, recorded a CD, and then sold it to raise money for their scholarship program. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, to, to wrap this up, we ask people that we've interviewed in, in, their, in, your, so, in your long career of social justice uh, work, um, is there anything that stands out to you that you're the most proud of that you did or that you were uh, present at? Hmm. I can't think of any one thing because so all of the significant things involved a lot of hardworking people. People who made sacrifices, you know. Um, I think the most important thing is the statehood movement, which uh, is going to succeed. Uh, you know, there is a strong element of Caucasian people in Ward 3 now who are taking the leadership. Anne Lyko, you know that yes. name? Yes, yeah, I know her, yeah. yeah. Yeah, she is very, very good at that. And uh, she has testified before the D.C. Council and before Congress. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud of her. Um, you know, every 4th of July they have a parade in Ward 3, and Anne and her husband are uh, are one of the leaders in that. Yeah. What else? I guess I can't think of anything that wasn't a group, a group thrust. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank for you for your time. Thank you very much. <laughs>